getting sidetracked Just when they think they got you game set match oh, oh, oh. Here comes a comeback Just cause you lay low Got up so unsteady comes a
Is this thing on? <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Real Life Silver Valley. Hi, honey. <laughs> I said good morning, and he was like right there. Uh, welcome. Go ahead and stand with us as we start off this morning praising the Lord. Here we go. everyone. You can have a seat. Welcome. My name's Kevin. If you don't know me, serve here at the church. And uh, I thought I'd kind of give you something funny. My, my daughter gave me a joke. So Silver Hoops is going on, right? So yesterday she's playing and uh, at one o'clock they had a dunk contest and I, I got peer pressure to do it, but I said no. I avoided that temptation so I don't blow up my knee again. However, during that time, I got a good joke because I told him I was doing welcome. So, what is a basketball player's favorite restaurant to eat at? Dunkin' Donuts. I heard it over there. All right. All right. Thanks for laughing. <laughs> um, 
If you got in without announcements or sermon notes, just raise your hand. A couple folks at the back will we'll get you that. Uh, just to, to give you an idea if you're new, um, inside you're going to see just a few scriptures, just a few, uh, but that's your notes. Uh, there's scriptures on the back and the front and some questions. Um, there's a connection card, so if you're new with us, I would ask if you could fill that out, and the reason why is we can just let you know that, hey, we really appreciate you coming. We can get you some information about the church, get you connected uh, where you're interested to get connected. If uh, you're a normal member, you can just fill it out. But a few things I just wanted to hit on this real quick. I think one of the most important things is here in the back. So if you are, if God is calling you to get connected into a ministry here, into volunteering, there's ways you can do that. Yes, I'm interested. But prayer. So if you guys put down a prayer, just know that um, that's faithfully prayed over every week by the not just the staff here, but we actually have a prayer team. And just know that uh, that's not just something that just gets put away. There's folks looking at that and praying about it every week. Um, in the back of your chairs, too, there's a, a blue card as well where you can write down prayer requests. Uh, but I'm just going to hit a few things here because there's a lot going on. It's a busy summer, but I just wanted to tell you about a few real quick. Uh, on the upper left there, the 101 membership class. So we've got one coming up Sunday, August 1st, 1.30 to 4.30. If you are interested in going, um, just let, you can let me know. You can call the church number, let Gene know, and uh, we can get you signed up. Just understand that with the 101 class, it goes right into what we believe God has called us to as a church here at Real Life. And we're going to go over what we believe because it's important to know what you believe as a church, right? And uh, it's, it's a really good class. Um, Gene does an awesome job teaching. He's, uh, I've been able to sit in on a few, and it's just, it's really, really amazing what, uh, what happens there in that, in that class. Uh, small group leader training. So we've got one this afternoon. You should have been contacted if your current small group leader. We've got another one coming up August 24th. Um, this is highly recommended for anyone that's leading a small group, a home group, a Bible study. And the reason why is we just want to make sure that as leaders, as if you're being, uh, if you're an apprentice, if you're thinking, man, I think God's maybe calling me to a leadership position leading a small group, we want to make sure you're equipped. And we want to make sure that you know that there's other godly men and women pulling in the same direction, trying to complete our mission as a church, making biblical disciples in a relational environment. And that relational environment is that small group. We're big on that because you guys can spend some time this morning, right, and getting into God's Word and seeing each other. But man, in a small group is where you can really dive deeper into relationship. What does God mean in His Word when He says this? How do I live it out? So put that on your calendar. Um, I'm helping put that training on. So if you guys have questions, if you guys have questions, just come to me and I'd love to, to talk about it. Um, also, we do have the ability uh, to receive offerings a few different ways. If you're new, do not feel obligated to give, okay? Uh, we're just glad you're here. I hope you're blessed um, with the worship and with the word. Uh, but you can give online. You can give through texting. We also have envelopes and boxes in the back. So if you're uh, being led to give, that's a couple ways you can do that. And the last thing I'm going to hit on is we got Pinehurst Days coming up. Uh, it's coming up August 6th and 7th. So if you look on there, this is going to be fun. So right out back, we've got an outdoor stage. We've done church out there a few times. Well, we're going to have Herbie the Love Bug on that big screen. It's going <laughs> to, yeah, it's a good movie. <laughs> uh, 9 p.m. And a bring a chair, a blanket. Um, we're going to have free hot dogs, popcorn. It's just going to be a really good time. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe as people are driving into town for Pinehurst Days, they, they see that going on and they come over and watch. Uh, but the next day, August 7th, so from 11 to 2, um, there's going to be a kid's corner during Pinehurst Days that our church is putting on, a splash pad, bouncy houses. The thing is, though, and you guys know this, events don't just happen, right? You've got to have people stepping in going, yeah, I want to help out. If you're like, where do I serve in this church? Right here is an awesome opportunity to where you can bless not only the kids in our church, but the kids in the community, and you can be God's light and uh, a friendly face there at Pinehurst Days. So we need help setting up, tearing down, having uh, adults there to watch the kids. It, it's going to be a really good time, but Amy Walsh is your contact. She's our uh, next-gen leader, and uh, 
is in charge of kids' ministry. So if you're interested, give her a call, give the church office a call, and we'll get you connected. So, okay, that's a lot going on. <laughs> so let me pray real quick, guys, and we're going to continue our worship. Father God, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the worship that we uh, get to have with you, God, and each other. Thank you, God, for the fellowship this morning. Thank you, Lord, for each person that's here, God. Um, you just love all of us so much, God. Uh, you're so good to us in the good times and the hard times, Lord. Help us remember um, just how holy you are, God. As Gene preaches today on your holiness, Lord, um, I just ask that you would be with him just during this message, God, that uh, we would have hearts that are open, ears that are open to ready to receive your, your word, Lord. Uh, thank you for this church, God. Um, just thank you for the ability to meet here in this in this building to be part of uh, part of your church, God, and uh, that we're we're called to be in relationship with you and each other, Lord. Um, we're just so thankful for that. Um, God, just thanks for the the awesome uh, music we get to listen to, and and just this ministry here with the worship team. Um, just thank you, Lord, for just everyone here this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. Go ahead and stand as we continue our worship this morning. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He, and together we see.
God, we love you. Thank you, Lord, that you are righteous, that you are faithful. Lord God, that you are holy. Thank you, Lord, that you, a holy God, want time with us. You desire to walk with us. Thank you, Lord. We love you in your precious name. Amen.
guys i love watching them worship isn't it cool that we get to do that together as a church we get to gather in the name of jesus this morning and we get to we get to worship his name together and i just love how god brings all of these different people from different places and different generations together it's that glimpse of what heaven's going to be like where people from every nation and every tongue gather to worship the name of jesus so uh this morning um, by the way, I'm Gene. If you're new with us today, I get to serve here as the lead pastor and uh, just super grateful to do that. You met Kevin earlier, who is our associate pastor. Isn't he awesome? I'm just, he just came on staff. If you're new with us, he came on staff just recently as our associate pastor, left 15 years as an Idaho state policeman to come on and, and answer a call of God to full-time ministry. And I, I am personally very, very glad that he did that. So um, excited for what God's going to continue to do in his life and in our life through, uh, through him as, he just, as people continue to say yes to Jesus. Um, so you heard next week, is it next weekend or two weeks from now, we're showing Herbie the love bug out back. How much fun is that going to be? Some of you, you may have to Google it, some of you, to find out who Herbie is. Uh, it's the original one, but would love for you to come out. And we just love that weekend. If you can have some time to come and, and serve, we're going we're gonna to be the church that weekend. It's one of those cool opportunities we have to get outside the building 
and just um, show the community the love of Christ in a super practical way. So I'm kind of hoping you can come out for that. Um, if enough people come out, I think uh, Comancheros are doing the car show again. So uh, the, the, the cool thing is, is we get enough, we can work in shifts so we can go look at the cars and be the church at the same time, right? That's the hope. And then Saturday night's the burnout. Uh, burnout's right next door. So I love living in Pinehurst. Are you kidding me? So, uh, so we've been talking this summer. We've been working through the attributes of God. You know, A.W. Tozer says that the, um, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you because it affects how you see everything. It affects how you see the world. It affects how you, how you use your money. It affects how you see eternity. And so we've been looking at all these different attributes this summer, um, not to try to, to get smarter, but so that we can take a step closer to God. We want to know him more. And so um, we, we kind of started out by saying that, that God's um, indescribable, right? And then we said we're going to try to use words this summer to describe them, right? It's been a challenge. We talked about how the fact that, that God's indescribable, yet he reveals himself to us, right? And through, through general revelation, right? When you look into the, uh, I love, we've got a lot of babies in our church right now. When you look into the eye of a baby, you see just the face of God. And I love how we're able to do those things. When you go out into nature and you, have you ever been just really early in the morning, maybe on a mountaintop and the, the, the dew's still down and, the, and, and the, the fog's down and you just, that, that, that holy silence, right? It just shows you what God's like, how, how powerful he is. We've been talking about all these different um, attributes. We talked about... Uh, the, the Trinity of God, that God has always existed in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, from eternity past to eternity future. And even our response to that, how we should be unified as God's unified. We talked about God as a creator and how creative he is. We talked about his ultimate creation, man, how we were created in his image. We talked about uh, uh, so many things. We talked about his justice. We, we, so you can go to rlmsv.com and catch up on those sermons if you'd like to, if you've missed any. We talked last week about God's faithfulness, how God's faithful. He has a plan and purpose for, for, for the world, for, for his people, and how faithful he is to his plan and purpose for his people. Even when his people aren't faithful, he is. And then today we're going to talk about his holiness. And this is a huge topic, and it's a hard topic for us to to, to wrap our minds around, because although it's a word we use a lot, right, holy smokes, right, holy bat cave Batman, we use that word a lot, but getting an understanding of what it means is kind of difficult. Sometimes it's, it's hard to grasp what it means that, that God's holy. It's even harder to grasp that he calls his people to be holy as he's holy. So we're going to attempt in these next few minutes together to, to, to talk about this idea. It's kind of a hard sermon. There's some hard stories. When we start looking deeply at the holiness of God, it, uh, it, it shows us how different we are than God, and, and that can be uncomfortable. I, I know it has been for me. Um, but then we also, in, in the holiness of God, we see, we see his perfection. So we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to teach us this morning, that our hearts would be open to him. So please join me. Father God, you are good. You're better than we think. You're bigger than we think. We need you more than, than we know. I thank you for your word, God, how you reveal your heart uh, toward us, for us. You reveal yourself, that we don't have to guess. I thank you, God, for um, just the mission that you came on to save us by sending your son. We are grateful. I, I don't understand your great love for us, but, oh, we're so, we're so glad that you do. Lord, as we, as we go through these words this morning, uh, I'm confident that your word will not come back void. So I pray that you would, you would open our, our minds and our hearts to hear from you. You would uh, uh, cancel the other voices, that, that your truth would combat any lies that we've, we've believed or, or we've been told. And you would just reveal to us your holiness, God. You would reveal your, your plan for us to walk with you. 
We love you, Lord, and, and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we start talking about holiness, it's the only attribute of God that's mentioned in triplicate in the Bible. So it, holy, holy, holy. There's three or a couple of places that's done. One of the places we're going to look at in Isaiah 6 this morning, it's also done when speaking of Jesus in Revelation uh, chapter 4, I think. And what that means by saying it three times, it means it's of supreme importance. If God writes a word in the scriptures once, it means it's true. If he writes it twice, it's an emphasis. Hey, you need to pay attention to this. But if it's three times, it's like, hey, this is super important. So this, and what it means is, is, is and here's the, the thing about God's attribute of holiness. It means it encompasses everything he is and everything he does. So when we start talking about like justice, it means it's holy justice. Next week we're going to talk about God's love. It means it's holy love. It encompasses all that he is. Now, I've got a definition of holiness in your sermon notes, if you look at that with me. And there's a couple different definitions, and probably more. This is very limited. So one of the definitions of holiness is it means different or unique or set apart. Right, So we get this idea that God is different than we are. It means um, uh, pure and separated from sin. Right, God is, has, has no sin. Uh, James tells us that in, in him there's no sin. There's no shadows in God. Right? He's completely pure, completely separated from sin. Right? Um, I, I wrote in here, many see holiness as the foremost attribute of all. Because holiness pervades all the other attributes of God and is consistent with all he does and all he is. The Bible talks about God's holiness from, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I've got some scriptures in your sermon notes this morning. 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, when talking about God, it says, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. We can see that he's utterly different than anything else or anyone else ever. We see in 2 Samuel 22, how great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. We talked about sovereignty some weeks ago. Uh, Brian Hall preached on that. And, then, and when he talked about sovereignty, we see that God doesn't need anything or anyone else. Right? God creates, and, and God just is all by himself. He's not dependent on us. We see in Isaiah chapter 40, to whom will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. And so this is really for our, our, our minds in 2021, this is important because we've actually created a culture where it's popular for us to, to decide whether God's fair or to decide whether God's true. How many people have you talked to that they said, if, if God will just do these things and convince me that he's true, I'll believe in him. But the thing about God is he doesn't, it doesn't change who he is whether we believe in him or not, because he is. In Jeremiah 10, chapter 6, it says, There's no one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. One of the ideas of the, of, the, of the holiness of God is that he possesses ultimate power. John Cook's going to talk about the omnipotence of God in a couple of weeks. But God's power is so powerful that it's almost frightening, as we'll see in a few moments. It says, who should not fear you, king of the nations? This is your due. Who should not fear you? Right? When, when he, he's saying, when we consider who you are, God, there should be a reverent fear in our hearts when we think about you, when we approach you. Who should not fear you, king of the nations? This is your due. Among all the wise leader of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. Think of the greatest leader that you know. The one you respect more than anyone, right? He, he or she is not even comparable to who God is. Isaiah 5, 16, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. He doesn't have to prove who he is, but what I love about that is God um, exercises his righteousness. It will prove his holiness. So his actions prove who he is. Psalm 99.9 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. So this is like a command to us of worshiping God because he is worthy of all worship. We're created for worship. You're worshiping something or somebody. And the Bible makes it clear 
the one to worship is God because he's the only one worthy. In Acts chapter 3, verse 14, when talking about Jesus, when telling the story of the gospel, he says, you disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. So we see this idea of holiness as, as Jesus is God. We see holiness, um, the, the, the title of holiness given to Jesus himself. Now we see examples of people, when, people like you and I, when they encounter a holy God. We see what happens. You know, it's, it's funny, one of the things we talk about, especially at Christmas, you know, we've got this idea of, of angels kind of floating around and, and being like fat little cherubs with, with little wings and, 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 you know, little bows and arrows and things like that. But when you look at who an angel is, a created being, an angel in Scripture, when a human encounters them, the first thing the angel typically says is, get up, <laughs> do not die, because the humans, when they come across the holiness of an angel, they're just like on their face because they're so amazing, right? Well, consider when they come face to face or when they come into the presence of a holy God. Isaiah chapter 6 is one of the most popular um, verse, uh, 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 passages that describe Isaiah when he sees who God is. So Isaiah, if you're new to the Bible, is one of the prophets. There's a book in the Bible, 66 uh, chapters worth, called Isaiah, a, a, a book, prophecy, a book in the Old Testament that he wrote about the coming Jesus, right? So, so consider Isaiah. If there's a book in the Bible named after you, you're probably a little holier than your peers, right? Okay, you're probably doing pretty good in your relationship with God. Okay, and, and this is why it's important because we kind of live this way. Man, uh, uh, I, I'm not, not quite as close to God as I want to be, but I'm closer than they are, so I'm doing pretty good, right? So consider Isaiah. It says in, in chapter 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, sealed, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. So this is the, the throne room of God. There's these angels flying around the, the throne of God. And we find out later in the New Testament, he's seeing Jesus exalted on the throne. They're flying around. They're covering their eyes because, because God is he's so holy, they can't look on him. They're covering their feet because they're realizing um, how, how dirty their feet are, is the way I understand it. They're flying around the throne. He sees God's majesty. The seraphim, they're worshiping God. They were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. You can't escape his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. He, he, he opens up the door to this amazing presence, right? The, the very foundation, the very door pros, the, the, the foundations of the temple are, are just shaking with his glory and with their worship. And what, is, what does Isaiah do? The first thing he does when, he, when he's in the presence of a holy God, he sees himself compared to that presence and he says, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. He doesn't say I'm doing better than these guys. Because the comparison isn't here. The comparison's here. And he says, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Brian Hall and I were talking before Friday night service. And we were just talking, he and I, we've known each other a long time. And we've, we've got a lot of mileage in the trenches together and our walk with God. So there have been years that we've just prayed for one another and encouraged one another in our shortcomings. And you know those stumbles that you make and you're just like, man, I thought I'd be further along in this walk with Jesus by now. Why, why am I still struggling with this besetting sin? Why do I keep doing what I don't want to do? When we were talking Friday night, it's like, you know, if we would look at the holiness of God more, if we take our eyes off of us and look at God more, I bet some of those sins would go away because we would be absolutely transfixed by God's holiness and his glory. It would change us. Right? Isaiah is like, Ugh. and then look what happens. We, we see, he's like, man, he's confessing, I am not God. I, I'm a sinful man, and I'm, I'm surrounded by a sinful people. 
But look what God does. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. One of the things that happens when we're in the, the, the presence of God, this is what I love about the, the gospel, is when we realize our sin in the presence of God's glory, in the presence of God's holiness, we understand that God sent his son to be a sacrifice to atone for our sins. When we put our trust in Jesus. He, 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 he cleanses us of our sins, but then he, he sets us aside for his use. As you look at the book of Isaiah, what happens next is they ask, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, I will go. He's being set aside, made holy for God's use. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Exodus, this is a story that many of us know. This is Moses at the burning bush. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? Then the Lord, when the Lord saw that he had gone over, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So here's what's going on is, is Israel, God's chosen people, had been in slavery in Egypt. And it says that God heard their cries. And so God was going to rescue them out of slavery. And he was going to send Moses to talk to Pharaoh. So God's going to set Moses apart for his, his work. And so God speaks to Moses through this brush, bush. And when God tells him, do not come any closer, take off your shoes, um, I think it's uh, uh, Matthew Henry in, his, in, in one, of his, one of the things I wrote, uh, read that he wrote. He says, what's going on here is God's telling Moses to take off his shoes because he wants Moses to understand that while God is present, he doesn't want him to get the the wrong idea about how familiar they can be. He wants them to understand how far a sinful man is from a holy God. It's like, Moses, I'm here to talk to you, but I don't want you to get the wrong idea about this relationship. I want you to understand I'm God, I'm holy. Because sometimes we get that one mixed up. The Bible tells us in in Hebrews chapter 4, this isn't in your sermon notes, but I know it's in your Bibles and and it'll be on the screen. The the Bible is is just this amazing thing that that while God is not like us, he invites us to, to, to come closer to him. And in Hebrews 4, it talks about the fact that we can come into his very throne room through Christ. Look at this in Hebrews 4. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, Jesus who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So so through Christ... We are brought into a right relationship with God. And through Christ, we are encouraged to go to God for wisdom, go go to God for grace in our time of need. But we don't go there flippantly. There's like this, this theology spreading across America that says God is a genie in the sky and he's just waiting to do your bidding that you can tell him what to do. God, I need this. God, I need more money. God, I I need to be healthier, wealthier, and wise. God, follow me around and do what I tell you to do. But God says, don't don't misunderstand. I am God. Come to me. I will give you wisdom. I provide for you. I protect you. But But don't misunderstand that I am God and you are not. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful 
And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. How do we approach God? Well, he's, he's, he's way bigger than we are. I think one of the reasons that it seems that, that, that Christianity is so unimpactful for people's lives is they have a very small view of God. They don't understand that he really is the creator of the universe. They don't understand that when he wrote his word, right, it really is his commands. And as his people, he actually expects us to follow him. Right? There, there's a shift that happens there. We, we think, well, he's going to forgive me. I'm really good at sinning. He's really good at forgiving. Me and God have an agreement. And then my question is, but, but will he? Will he? Man, this is so much more stuff I want to talk about that we don't have time for. But look at this. Therefore, since we're receiving the kingdom that cannot be shaken, this is Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And when you start talking about God's holiness, there are stories in the Bible that are hard. In, in Leviticus chapter 10, we're talking about Aaron, who's, who's uh, part of the, the priesthood. So the priests in the Old Testament, the, 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 the temple was an earthly representation of heaven. And there were different places in the temple, and they had temple priests who were to, who were to um, be mediators between um, God and his people, but they were also to, to, to minister to the Lord. And there was a room in there called the Holy of Holies, and the great or the, the high priest would go in once a year to make atonement for the people's sin. And church, church legend talks about the fact that um, when the high priest would go in there, um, he would actually have bells around his, uh, tass uh, around his garment. And so they would hear him when he was walking around because they were afraid that when he was in the presence of a holy God, he may die. And they would tie a rope to his leg and pull him out. That's that's church legend over the years. It's not in the Bible. But it kind of gives you an idea of how they looked at God's holiness, doesn't it? It says Aaron's son. So Aaron's one of the priests. And he has sons. And they were working. They were priests working in the temple. And then they were told in the temple, this is how you worship God. Right? They would have to cleanse themselves. They had, they had, they had exact... Um, methods and practices they were to follow to worship God. It says, His sons, Nadab and Ab Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And then they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So God had told them, this is how you approach me, this is how you worship me. And they were like, hey, we think we have a better idea. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. So consider Aaron, if you will. Your sons have just been consumed by fire. Right? You're going to have some, maybe, some things to say. And Moses is reminding Aaron, this is what God told us. And it says, Aaron remained silent. You're right. What argument do I bring against a holy God? These are hard. We've got this story of a man by the name of Uzzah. And so a little backstory is the Ark of the Covenant would go in the temple and it would, it would, it would contain, um, uh, the, it's where the presence of God would be in the temple. And they were told when you transport the Ark of the Covenant, it actually had some rings on each side and there would be long poles. And they, the priests would carry the Ark of the Covenant by the poles and the whole idea was don't touch the Ark of the Covenant because it's holy and people aren't. And... They're going to transport the Ark of the Covenant. And it says here in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bela and Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God. 
which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark on a new cart and brought it out from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel, they were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nakan, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. It's on a cart, oxen stumbles, the ark of God is going to fall and hit the ground. Uzzah reaches out to touch it to keep it from hitting the dirt. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of the irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Are you kidding me? This is God? They had been told this is how you transport the ark. David says we have a different way. They were told, stay away, don't touch the ark of God. Uzzah, I mean, if I'm standing next to the ark, I have to be honest, if the ark has fallen, I'm probably going to do the same thing, right? Because I'm thinking, man, this is not, let's just keep the dirt away from the ark. And one of the guys that I read that wrote about this said, um, Uzzah thought that his hand was less sinful than the dirt. There's so many things here. Look at verse 8. David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. He's angry. Look at the next verse. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? If God's going to take people out for that reason, who in the world won't be killed? See, when we come into, into view of the holiness of God, we start understanding. It brings within us reverent fear. It should. It should. Because we see how perfect he is, and we see how per- imperfect we are. Now, now, here's the thing. That while God is separate, he's not distant. So I want you to understand this. He's not distant. It says he's present. And God had every right and has every right to be in heaven making judgment on his people because they, 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 they fall short of his holy, perfect mark because we've sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in God's holy love, he sent his son on a rescue mission. See, this is the good news. The good news doesn't, it isn't good if we don't understand the bad news that comes before it. And so many times we want to skip over the bad news and we say, you know, we're actually pretty cool. The only thing wrong with me is someone needs to hug me a little more often. If they would hug me more often, then I would be a better person. If my mom and dad had just given me more stuff, then I would be a better person. But what we don't understand is the reality is, is that we are separated from God because of sin. And the good news is, That God so loved the world, or this is how God loved the world, as he sent his son Jesus to die. God, who came, left heaven and came to earth. One of the names we call Jesus at, uh, that we celebrate a lot at Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us. The Bible says, while we were yet enemies of God, God came and was willing to die. It says, people won't die for an enemy, but they, this is a Gene's paraphrase, they might die for a good man, but the amazing thing about the gospel is that while we were God's enemies, Jesus Christ went to the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And what happens is, is Jesus does something that we can't do for ourselves. He changes our standing before God. The Bible says that when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and we're following him, we repent of our sin, and we follow Jesus, we ask for forgiveness, It says that we become uh, made right in his presence. You are declared holy in God's sight through Christ. You go from sinner to saint, enemy of God to friend of God. I love what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made Christ, 
who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ, declared holy. Ephesians 2, 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. We, we talk about it, Richard and I talk about it, that God uh, saved us, he's saving us, and he will save us when we go into glory. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, I am writing to God's church in Corinth to you. We have been called by God to be his own holy people. So we talked about Isaiah. He was set aside for God's use. So this idea for us is we've been redeemed from the world and we're set aside for God's use. Right? So, so I want you to think about this. Your whole past. So I, I talk to people all the time and they're like, you know, I invite them in. Man, God wants to, wants to work in your life. He wants to work through your life. And they're like, there's no way God could ever use me. And I'm like, why not? They don't, you don't know the things that I've done. Well, God does, and here's what God wants to do. He wants to take those things that you have done, those things that you are doing. He wants to redeem them. He wants to use them for his glory to show other people how good he is. Right? When he forgives you of sin, he sets you aside for his use. He says, now I want to use your life. I've shared this with you before. The, the worst parts of my life, my, my separation from my wife because of my sin, God has redeemed those things, and he's using them in the lives of other people. He uses that. It's like God's showing off to the universe about how he changes people and changes their lives and changes their purposes. This is the good news of the gospel, right? It's not just we're going to go to heaven one day. We are in Christ, but it's also how God wants to use us in his kingdom today. Look at this. It says, he made you holy by means of Christ Jesus. You are made holy by Christ. Most of us don't wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, good morning, holy one. But it doesn't make it any less true. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus, their Lord and ours. 1 Peter 2.9, you are chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, now you have, your life has a new purpose. It's not just about making money now. It's not just about raising kids. It's to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into this wonderful light. And so many people are missing out so many people are saying, no, God, you can't use me. So many people are saying, no, I, I just, so, uh, you know, I, I heard a guy that was talking about worship, and he goes, why is the worship just so boring in churches? And he said, and, and the, the interviewer that, that was being interviewed said, well, it's because the churches are so full of people that don't believe God. If we believed God, if we believed who we were before we met Christ, if we believe who we are in Christ, man, it would change the way we call out to this God. It would change the way we pray. It would change the way we sing about his glory and his holiness, wouldn't it? So there's right, right position before God. You are declared holy. But there's also this right being or right living that God calls us to. So we're, we're positionally holy before God. And God says, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to live like you are. I want you to start learning to be holy. And here's where I have to be careful because sometimes we preach this gospel of, 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 of works that says I got to clean myself up for God. But there's a gospel of grace that says that God's cleaned me up. Now I'm going to live as a clean person. And that takes some effort. I mean, it takes, it, 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 it's hard to change. Anyone else having a hard time? But here's the thing about grace is grace empowers us to be who God says we are. Is this amazing? You're not doing it on your own. Right? One of my favorite books is The, uh, the Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And he talks about a farmer. A farmer goes out and spreads seed. And a farmer, you know, um, I guess you probably, whatever you do to the ground before you, I'm not a farmer. Right? Um, what do you do to the ground before you put the seeds in? Till it. Right? You till it. You put the seeds in, you weed it, you water it, all that stuff, right? 
And no, I don't want to be a farmer, in case you're wondering. I got a garden gene. You can come learn. I'm good. Um, but, so the farmer's working to do that, right? But he knows without the world going around, without the rain, without the sun, all of his work is for naught. So he realizes, the farmer realizes he's working with God. Our pursuit of holiness, our move toward holy living is exactly the same thing. We realize we need God's help. We can't do it on our own. But we also realize that God gives us a part to play in it. You with me? Okay. So right being, look at 1 Peter chapter 15 and 16. Chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But just as he who called you is holy, God, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I'm holy. This isn't written to the super saints. This is written to you and I. Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Man, we could just stop right there and talk for the next couple hours. Make every effort. But what about when they're not peaceable? He's not talking about them. He's talking about you. Make every effort. Some of us need to underline the word every. Make every effort to live at peace with everyone, even people from different states, even people with different license plates, even people that voted differently than you did in the last election. Even people that maybe have more t- tattoos than you think is comfortable or people that listen to music that's got more rhythm than you're comfortable with. Make every effort to live at peace with everyone and to be holy. Make every effort to be holy. Make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared. Right? So God's grace... We love God's grace, his unmerited favor toward us. His grace has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Oh, I love that. I can be saved by Jesus, right? And also grace teaches us. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So those of you that are saying, God's just got to take me the way I am. He's just got to get used to me. Because I'm not going to change. That is not biblical. God has started a good work in you. And he will be faithful to complete that work. But you got to work with God. Like we like to center in on one verse. And God's like, I wrote the whole Bible. Try reading the whole Bible. Right? But look at this. No to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, today. That sin, that sin is just there. And you're just, you're just like, man, it's okay because it's way less than the other sins that I had. God's like, no, we're going to do business with that one too. Right? And here's the thing. You don't have, right? Look at Philippians 2.13. God is working in you. God's working in you, giving you the desire to empower to do what pleases him. That, that, that tension that you feel inside of you, that tension that Paul writes about in, in, in Romans 7, I don't do the things I want to do, I do the things I don't want to do, that tension, that's the Holy Spirit working inside of you. That tension is God. And I, I, I tell Christians all the time, man, you won't regret saying yes to God, ever. You won't regret it, but it's hard. I get it. It is hard. Because there is a a fundamental shift going on in our life that we are going, we are experiencing the difference of sinner and saint. And it's a process. And it's going to last the rest of your life. You will not be perfect until you are glorified in heaven. But God has begun a good work in you and he wants to accomplish that work in your life for his glory. He wants to do that. He wants to use you. It is like his example of his goodness. Look at this in in, in, in Ephesians, so, so here's how we work with him. Ephesians 4, 20 and 24. He, he's, com- he's contrasting the way the Gentiles, the people outside the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, how they lived and how they treated other people. And then he's talking to God's people. He says, that, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, your sinful way of life, your ungodly way of life, You were taught in regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, 
which is being corrupted by his deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, which is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So, so this process is the sanctification process. Is we're being changed and conformed to the image of Christ. We talk about it here a lot, head, hand, head heart, hands. So the head, right, we make a decision to follow Christ. We read something in his word, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit wrote the word, and he confirmed something in our minds. And then there's this process, this 18-inch process this is the longest 18 inches in the world where God takes his word from your mind and he starts changing your heart with it okay and he just starts this work and for some of us there's some things in our life that happen so fast like like I was a, a, a in the navy for 10 years I was a tower rat for a number of years I've told you before I was an artist in profanity I was just really good at it. I used it for everything God took that away from me so fast right there's some other things in my life that are glacially slow. But God's been working on me for 20 years, right? But, but here's, how, like, here's how his word, his word works. I, I talk about this a lot. It takes the, the Spirit of God, the people of God, and the Word of God to help us change. So here's the Spirit of the Word. Spirit of God writes the Word of God, right? The Word of God, um, we, we learn the Word of God. And then we've got this issue in our life. And here's what the Spirit of God does is he brings that word of God to your mind, right? But he doesn't bring it to your mind until it's, until you, until you, until it's there. It's the way it appears anyway. God can do what he wants. But it appears for us that we actually have to read the word before we know the word. And what the Spirit of God does is he reveals the word of God, brings it to mind. And then with his grace, he empowers you to apply that word of God to your life you got a part to play in this, right? So let's talk about holy habits real quick, okay? A um, couple things. This is out of a, a Bridges book, The Pursuit of Holiness, which if you, if you need a book to read this summer, The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges or The Discipline of Grace by Jerry Bridges. I'm a huge Jerry Bridges fan, um, and, and I'm a fan because he writes books that are simple enough for me to understand, right? But he also writes super practical books. And if, if you didn't get time to write that down, um, come to me after service, and I'll, 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 I'll remind you of what, they're, what they are. But he talks about developing holy habits, okay? And so what this means is we're dependent on the Spirit. We understand that, right? That's where it starts, right? It starts with us abiding in Christ. Everything starts there in a relationship with Christ. If you don't know Jesus yet, I want to tell you, you can try to clean yourself up, but you will not, you will not ever experience lasting change without the, the Spirit of God living in you. You will not. But when you come to Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sin and to be your Lord and Savior and to give you the, the grace to repent of your sin and to follow him, the Spirit of God will enter in you. The power of God that raised Jesus from the dead resides within followers of Jesus. It's an amazing thing that happens. And he empowers us to be who he says that we are. So the first thing is we develop habits, uh, habits of holiness by positive repetition. I told you a couple weeks ago, they say that the, the, the study that the the, uh, the, the Bible network did or Bible organization said that when people engage the Bible four or more times a week, they start actually experiencing life change. So those of you that are reading the Bible once a week and you're so mad because you don't seem to be being changed by it, there's something about repetition that, change, that, that we're creatures of habit, you and I. Okay? So, repetition. So, Philippians 4 talks about think on good things, whatever's pure, holy, worthy of praise, right? So well, how do we start changing the way we think? We actually take that verse and we're like, okay, I'm going to change the way I think. I'm going to think of good things. I may have to have some things written down, right? I, I write things on my mirror all the time in my bathroom. Use a whiteboard marker. You can wash it off, okay? We'll write things down on, hey, I, I need to think of this this morning. I need to be reminded of this. I need to be reminded of who I am in Christ. I need to be reminded. Sometimes some of you need to be reminded who your mate is. You've got them mixed up with your enemy, right? And so you need to be reminded. My mate, before she's God's daughter, she's my wife. I mean, be, no, before she's God, my wife, she's God's daughter. I got that one backwards. It's way better than the faux pas I made Friday night. Okay, number two. So we start establishing holy habits. Maybe it's prayer for you. Man, I just want to grow in prayer. Okay. Cell phones, something that they have on them that's really cool. It's called a calendar. 
Make an appointment for yourself to pray every day. Stick it in your phone. Okay? And then every day at that time, pray. Number two, don't let an exception occur. Here's what happens sometimes. When we're trying to change a habit, we allow some other habits in our lives, or, or, or just this one time. Right? So like, uh, for me, uh, cutting down on sugar. Oh, man. Only because it leads to gluttony in my life if I'm not careful. Okay? And so... Well, just this one time, it'll be okay because we're celebrating Richard's birthday. I'll have two pieces of cake because I haven't had any cake in like a month. And it's going to be okay. But what happens the next time? It's harder to say no, isn't it? Maybe it's cussing for you. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's porn. Just this one time. I mean, God's going to forgive me. Just this one time, it's okay if I do it. The next time, though, it becomes even harder to say no. So the, the, the encouragement is, don't let any exception occur. Lord, help me. I don't want to lie anymore. So I'm not going to tell any lies, okay? And then I'm going to be diligent in all the other areas of my life also. So I'm going to do the best I can to be who God says that I am. Because what happens is, if, we, if we're like, I'm going to work on this sin, but just let the other sins go at it, it's okay. What happens is, when you allow that other sin in your life, it weakens your resistance to this sin that you're working on. It's who we are. And then lastly, don't be discouraged by failure. Some of you need to hear this one again. Don't be discouraged by failure. The life of a Christian is a life of repentance. It just is. We are going to be stumbling and bumbling for the rest of our lives. And this is why I think God said that the church is supposed to meet in community together. This is why I'm constantly talking to people about not everyone has to know your temptations or your struggles, but someone does. Who's your person that when it's just too hard for you and it just feels like it's crushing Who's the person that knows you that you can go to and say, man, it is so hard. The Bible talks about us carrying that, that weight for one another, doesn't it? And that idea is when the weight's too heavy. And, and I know some of you are like, man, I'm way too strong to be that guy. I just got to be honest with you. I'm way too weak to do this alone. Because my goal in life, I didn't start out well, and either did you. The Bible says no one starts out well. But my goal is to finish well. And I think that's a God-given goal that he's given me. My goal for you, and I have one, is to finish well. I want you to know Jesus, and I want you to walk with Jesus, and I want you to, to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and what it means to make disciples of Jesus when you get to heaven. I want you to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want that for you more than maybe some of you want that for you. And so someone has to know my stuff. And so, and here's why, because when things get hard, the first thing that we do is we pull away, and we go, and we like to get alone, right, and because that shame becomes too much, and the devil likes it when you're alone, because then he has free reign with you, and you're not as strong alone as you are in, in community with other people. That's why the Bible's written to communities of people, not individuals. And so I just want to encourage you in that. Man, who is your person? Who knows your stuff? Well, how do they find out my stuff? I'm just the awkward guy, so here's what I'll do. I'll call on someone and say, hey, we got to have a conversation. I, 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 want, I want you to know my life. I've done, it with some, I've done it with some of you. You need to know my life, and here's why. And I want to know your life, and you don't have to tell me your life, and it's okay. I don't want to know all your lives. That's just too much. Okay? But someone needs to know your life. Jesus does. He does. He does. He does. He does. He knows everything about you. He knows those, those worst things about you that you're not even a, willing to talk about yourself. He knows them, and he loves you, and he wants someone else to be in your life. We've got to walk this stuff out together. That's called the church. And the way we love one another, the way we love one another when we find out each other's junk, the way we love one another when someone stumbles, it says it shows the world that Jesus is real. 
It's amazing that we get to do. So I want to pray for us because I'm, I talk a little bit long. So uh, apologize to kids' ministry for me. But um, let's pray, and then we'll, and Kevin will come up and lead us through communion. So Father God, we thank you. I just thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. I thank you, God, for, for being holy, being all-powerful and being perfect. I thank you, God. It makes you, it, you are so worthy of worship, and I thank you, Lord, that the, 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 the biggest act of worship that we can make is to give you our lives to be changed by the renewing of our minds, to, to be changed by, by following your will. That's true worship, God. I pray that you would lead us in that, that by your grace we would believe who you say we are in Christ. And by your grace, God, you would empower us to live um, as the people you say we are. Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy. I just thank you, Lord, for your, for your great love for us. Help us to believe your truth. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, so we're going to continue worship this morning and fellowship with the giving and receiving of communion. So the... Ushers are going to get that ready to, to pass out, and uh, just as they're doing that, I just wanted to talk about communion just a little bit. So this is a time for Christians, that's those that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and uh, you know, I just wanted to, to remind you, and, and Gene just did a great job talking about this, but we're declared holy in Christ, that means we're made right. And communion is a way that we can do that. Um, you know, it's a privilege to be able to take communion. And uh, I just want you to think about that this morning. This is your time where you can be made right with Christ. Um, it's a reminder of the finished work that Jesus did on the cross uh, through his blood. It's a new covenant. And it's also a, a proclamation of that we're publicly acknowledging that we belong to Jesus and the body of Christ. And so as the elements are being passed out, if you just want to hold on to them, we'll take them together um, as a family. And we're going to go through a little bit of a process before we take the communion. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Uh, God's Word, and specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, talks about we're to take communion in a worthy manner. And, uh, you know, that makes me think of God's holiness, that, that reverent fear, that respect. And the Word tells us we can do this through self-examination, through directed prayer. And so as a family here, we're going to do that uh, together. Uh, the first thing I would ask you to do in this time of prayer is to confess any sins to God. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And uh, Hebrews 4 talks about how we can go into God's throne room this morning. That's what you get to do this morning as a Christian. You get to pray to Jesus, the high priest, to receive that mercy and grace. And so, you know, God, God knows your sin. He knows everything. And uh, he gives us that mercy and grace to be made right through Jesus. So this morning, in the quietness of your heart, if you want to close your eyes, bow your head, and just lift up those sins to the Lord. remember you're made right through Jesus. Uh, next, I would ask that you pray for those that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Um, think about, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a family member. So just use your sanctified imagination, just picture their face, just call out their name to Jesus and just lift them up. Let's do that now.
And I would also ask this morning, uh, you would lift up those that are hurting. Uh, we've had a lot of, lot of things happen in our little community here in the last few weeks. And, you know, God knows every one of those hurts. Um, and I would ask this morning, ask how God can use you to minister to those that are hurting. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about how as Jesus comforts us in our troubles, we can comfort those that are in trouble. And we can just show people the mercy and the love and the grace of the Lord. And so just this morning, let's lift up those that are, that are hurting. And then lastly, if you would just pray for God's church, it's those Christian churches that are following Jesus, that they're preaching God's word. So lift up those in the valley. Just think about those uh, churches around the country and around the world that are doing the Lord's work, even when it's not convenient, even when their, uh, their life is in danger. So just pray for God's church this morning that we would lift Jesus high. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see this picture of Jesus with his disciples at the Last Supper. And the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said that this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in, remem in remembrance of me. So let's take the juice together. And if you would pray with me. Oh God, you're a holy God, Lord. We, we lift you up high, God, this morning. Um, you're, you're so much bigger. You're so much better than we think, God. Just help us to see you clearly this morning, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of your, of your word and to be in your throne room in prayer, God. Um, I just lift up each person this morning, Lord. You know where they're at in their walk with you, God. And God, I lift up those that are struggling, that you would uh, give them encouragement, God, that your people would come alongside them. Um, God, keep Keep encouraging those and give those strength and power just to continue that are doing well, God. Help them to continue to uh, live out their faith. And God, I pray those that are lost this morning, Lord, that as they seek you out, God, you seek them out first, Lord, and they would see you, the, the, true, the true God of the universe. They would see you, Jesus. Um, thank you, Lord, for your word and through Gene's message through your word this morning. Uh, thank you for the offering, God, that it would be used uh, in your will, Lord, to multiply and, and to uh, be used in your kingdom. Um, thank you, Lord, for Jesus and uh, the mighty, mighty God he is. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to have one more song to finish up with with our worship. And if you would like any prayer, anything you want to share, praises, there'll be a few of us up on the side. Go ahead and stand as we close the service. Lord of all creation. Of water, earth, and sky. 
the heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are When I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by season and so praying for the wildland firefighters that are here uh, supporting the fire suppression in, in our county and and maybe even asking God how's a way what is a way that I can minister to those folks you know maybe you see someone at a store as they're coming in for supplies to pray for them or uh, buying them water or, or whatever that looks like a real practical way um, and not having any fires so don't have any campfires Okay, um, but today I want to I want to use a prayer from Ephesians three for us today. That I think this is the Apostle Paul being Pastor Paul, as he writes to his church, and this is the prayer for us today. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. 
I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you. Have a great day.